We are happy to be welcoming Jerry Byrne, the head coach of Harvard. A little background on him. Uh, Jerry grew up in Levittown, New York, where he attended Chaminade High School on Long Island. Uh, you played college across at UMass, followed by a professional career playing both outdoor and pro indoor lacrosse. His coaching career includes over, six, over 20 years of coaching experience, most notably spending 16 years as the assistant coach at Notre Dame and being recognized in 2011 as coach of the year, assistant coach of the year. This past July, he ultimately made the move to become the head coach of Harvard and uh, again, we're excited to have Coach Byrne join us and would like to thank him again for taking the time. Hey, thank you and, and perfect timing. My wife just uh, walking in from, uh, from work. Thanks for having me, fellas. And I appreciate the opportunity to chat with you, have some laughs, talk about lacrosse and uh, hopefully share some value with your, your audience. Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the first kind of questions, um, obviously, we're all dealing with the, uh, the COVID-19 situation and college across kind of uh, the landscape kind of changed a little bit. Talk to me about how you're kind of dealing with that with your current uh, players and, 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 and staff. You know, I don't think there's a you know, playbook. You know, I think, you know, it was, we were fortunate in hindsight to be at a place like Harvard that, you know, we had a little a, a kind of a, a forecasting that this could potentially happen. So I think we had a, a couple of days, you know, um, heads up that this could happen. So it allowed us to think about how we might communicate with our players and our recruits and things like that. But th there's nothing that prepares you for it. You, you know, I like to read and I like to read case studies and, and, you know, business articles and things like that. So you can go back and look at, you know, what did, you know, Johnson and Johnson and do when there was a Tylenol scare 30, 40 years ago, or, you know, what, what happened when the subprime market uh, crashed and, you know, how, how do you learn from these really terrible situations? And so, but there's nothing that prepares you for it. I think, you know, what I think nearly every coach is trying to do is, all right, trying to figure out what's the schedule of communication with your players? How much coaching are you doing? How much, advice and insight are you doing how much how often are you doing zoom how much how often are you texting and i think everybody's kind of using you know a little trial and error to figure out what works uh but what 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 may work for harvard might not work for another program and so i think there's a lot of trial and error uh but i, I think this is a tremendous opportunity for uh, a program to, to to almost test and practice either a philosophy or a strategy around certain things. So whether it's giving independence and autonomy to your upperclassmen or letting some of your leadership run the workouts and, and things that are taking place. I'm, I'm a big fan of that. And I think that this is an opportunity because we may not be together again until next September. So instead of trying to micromanage everything, my approach has been to to listen and watch and delegate and empower and give uh, my guys a chance to grow. And because I think you have, you can make some mistakes right now that aren't gonna come back and bite you next April. There's a lot of time and who knows how long we're gonna be um, at home. And so you better be pacing yourself with your messaging and how you manage and how you lead because you don't want to get Niedermeyer three months later, you know, killed by his own troops. Yeah. And so that's an Animal House reference if you guys didn't get it, any of your yeah. listeners at home. But I don't want to get Niedermeyer. So I would like them to work with me in a real collaborative way to help manage 30-something guys and then potentially integrate our incoming class. So I, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but there's, I think the short answer is nobody has the perfect solution but you have to be really open to being really attentive to what's working, what's not working, because you have time to, to switch things out. Hey, this is really works. Let's continue to do that. This isn't working. Let's stop doing that. I think you have to be kind of open to both of those things. Yeah. Now, um, a big talk, big cut, like almost, almost a controversy going on right now is the kids getting granted an extra year of eligibility, except – all right, for those kids that maybe go to like an Ivy League school or the Ivy Leagues won't let them kind of return. Can you kind of talk about that? And I guess like, you know, some people might be like, man, like, you know, the Ivy Leagues are kind of like, uh, 
um, they might get hurt by this. How do you feel about that? Um, you know, I kind of how I feel is almost irrelevant. I mean, I think anybody, anybody who went through having to get your team together and let them know that their season and for some of them, their potentially their careers were over, you know, there, there's nothing that prepares a coach for that. There's no grad school class and, and how to deliver that message. Um, but like in that moment, in those first like 72 hours where everybody went through this, you, 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 you actually saw, you know, a lot of lessons, you know, the, the fact that the, the Ivy league was one of the you know, first leagues, if not the first league to do this, people were berserk. And mostly they were berserk because they, they see it through the prism of their own, you know, their fandom or their allegiance and fidelity to a school or a program. And people were, you know, completely, you know, unglued and, and again, emotional, right? And, 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 and how little we knew about the virus. And so now you fast forward six weeks later, I, I don't think people feel the same way. But right in that moment, and this was this is ultimately my feeling on it, there was universal as the world, you know, and as the world became aware of what the virus was going to do and potentially do, we all had shared pain. And so if you were a college athlete of any sport, we were all if you were a spring athlete, you were all in the same boat. And I think there was tremendous power in that. And and but it's also true of the person who was doing their dance thesis or producing a, a play in the spring of their senior year at Harvard or high school. Everybody was treated the same. It was completely democratic because everybody was in the same boat. And now you have a completely different scenario where the Ivy League has decided one thing and, and the rest of the country has decided something else. And that basically pulls that scab back off. And so when it was universal, you couldn't have an argument to say, is it worse for Harvard who was two and two and, you know, new coach, new program, trying to figure things out? Or was it worse for Princeton who was five and oh and had a seminal player and things like, you couldn't debate that. Like, cause it's painful for both. And you could, you have arguments on either side, but both shared pain. And so, you know, I was a big, believe not a big advocate in the fifth year because I, I because I knew once you started splitting this, this is when when it would become terrible. And then you had to make financial decisions and families would have to make financial decisions and teams would have to make decisions on bringing in transfers or which of their seniors are they going to bring back and that they can afford. So it, it now creates all these layers that that are really human and really costly on a, on a lot of levels. And so, you know, as much as I would have loved to have my guys back, if that was the universal decision of all the programs, I would have been all for it. But the fact that, you know, the Ivy League made this decision, it's above my pay grade. And I, I shared my feelings that I would love to have uh, our guys back. But once it became a, a presidential decision at the, at the, at the uh, Ivy League level and an athletic director's decision at their level, but even within that, there, there, there'll be Ivy League guys back in the Ivy League because uh, each team, has, each school, I think, has the autonomy to do some of these things. Um, some schools have the ability to have guys have to get second majors. Some do not have some semester rules. Harvard has a – you can only be at Harvard for a certain number of semesters. Uh, withdrawal, withdrawal is a – at a lot of the Ivy League schools is a – it's fraught with some – you know, you can leave, but we can't always – guarantee you that you can come back. And so, you know, when, and when everybody started customizing these potential solutions, that's where we are now. So how I feel about it is kind of irrelevant because I don't have any power to change. And I try to, I can't think of the Psalm, but I try to be rational about the things that I can affect and the things that I can't. And, um, and try to focus on our team. You know, all of our seniors have great career paths and, and great opportunities going, but I do miss them. I do. It is. It's. It's sad to to not think about your your season ending on the field, where at least you can look back and maybe you have some regret about how you played, but you had the opportunity to to perform, and the scoreboard told you what your next outcome was going to be. The fact that you can't do that is is really sad. But the fact that some of these guys and gals will be able to work that out, good for them. It just won't be at Harvard. Yeah. 
I can only imagine, um, like you were referencing, I mean, at some of the schools, you got kids that are going to be returning, you got all these transfers coming, and then you got incoming freshmen. So essentially, you got a class of like 20 freshmen. I mean, I mean it must be some coaches must be going mad just trying to figure out like every player. Yeah. They got to try to figure out is this a four year guy? Is this a five year guy? Do I even maybe recommend maybe he doesn't come back? I don't know. It's crazy. No, no, you're, you're, listen, this is, you know, the law of unintended consequences. Yeah. You know, when this was announced, I think the NCAA out, out, of, out, of, out of like a real human, like we need some good news. There seems to be a lot of clamor for this. There's smart people that work there. But I don't think they factored in the cultural piece, which you just referenced. I don't think they factored in the financial piece in a time where, you know, every university's endowment is probably down 30%. And you're going to have to pay more and spend more and, and make some of those decisions. Yes, Mike, you can come back. Jake, you can come back. Jerry, you can't come back. We don't have any money for you. And so, you know, those conversations and – your team is bigger at a time where the financial pressures on athletics is really intense. You're going to have more expenses or you're going to have the same amount of money, but we'll be able to spend less per athlete. So yeah. you got that effect. And then you have the cultural piece, which is, listen, adding talent is, is very tempting, but if you don't know, you know, how they're going to integrate in your locker room, integrate into your system, how your, your existing players are going to accept that, that guy, hey, you recruited me. I've been here for three or four years, and now you're bringing in a mercenary into my program. And even the best guy has got to – even the best player and the best person who – you know, there's three or four really obviously high, high targets for, for these 50 years. Even the best guy in that situation, he's got to, he's got to balance his confidence in his game and his – because you can't get to the level of being one of those really great players if you don't have confidence in the work ethic – and be some level of deferential and subservient and how do I fit in? You know, this is not like the NFL where they drop and add guys every week and they know it's a business and it's clearly a business and they're making those decisions. This is the, the, the ecosystem of a team is a very volatile thing. And if you, you know, bringing in the wrong guy, and spending money that maybe was supposed to go to somebody else and that guy doesn't work out from a wins and losses or from a culture standpoint, you can pay the price of that for a couple of years. Yeah, and so just, that's, why, that's why I think you haven't seen a lot of these guys land yet because I think there's a financial piece. There's a navigating, um, you know, what you're doing with your existing seniors if you're at one of these programs and what is your school going to fund and what can a parent – support like you know if you're joe blow from kokomo and you love your son but your job is in jeopardy and your retirement's been hit 30 percent you know you're making a tough decision you know to play the eight games that you missed is that you know and are you going to get another degree is it going to be some joke is it worthwhile are you a mercenary or were you planning on doing fifth year like there's there's so much that goes into it. And, I, you know, on one hand, I love being in the mix of all that stuff back in the day. Uh, the fact that I, I'm not and I can't be is somewhat liberating. And I think there's a win for the team, you know, the handful of teams in our league that won't have, you know, 50 years. I think there's a win for us in recruiting because it's always a competition when you come in as a recruit. And now you don't have to recruit against returnees and transfers and things like that. The fact that it's a – a relatively clean slate. I think that's going to be attractive to, to, to parents and prospects. Yeah. I, you know, I think you kind of already answered this question, but you know, if I'm a coach, you're, you're a really competitive guy. Uh, we're uh, competitive. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Just a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. All right. But uh, I mean, doesn't it piss you off? I, maybe I can't do that on this interview. But no, like, you can say that. It's fine. All right. Doesn't it, doesn't, doesn't it make you upset that it's like, shit, like now I'm going to have to go against teams that, have 24 year olds on the team now because they're, they're, they're taking a fifth year and I'm not able to do that. You know what I mean? There's a difference between a 24 year old and a, you know, a 19 or 20 year old, you know, my best lacrosse was the first couple of years. Like I felt I was my best player the first couple of years out of college, you know what I mean? And, and now, now these guys are all coming back. You know, I, I, I don't, 
you know, listen, you, I, you can call it a rationalization on my part, but I think that you still only allow 10 people on the field. And there, there is a curse of the gluttony of too much talent. You yeah. know, so if you're, if they have, you know, if you have too many really good guys and only so many can play, you better manage your culture very carefully. And that's why you see so many people transfer and, and leave places because they, they chose to go to a place because maybe lacrosse was the only reason. And now when lacrosse isn't working out, that's why you're seeing so many people leave. Even before the pandemic, you're seeing a lot of people uh, leave because they, they didn't go for multiple reasons. They went for one reason. And so the, as far as like being upset about it, I, I'm looking for the, the silver lining in it. I'm, I'm looking for potential future recruiting opportunities to say that, hey, you're going to come into a competitive environment, but you don't have to worry about some of the other things, the other schools that you might be considering having, you know, several years of players returning and several years of, of you know, fifth-year guys. And, and not only fifth-year guys from their program, fifth-year guys from other schools. So th I think there's an attractive element in, in that. And again, like I just said, you still only allow 10 guys on the field. And I like the I like the challenge of it because I think you can you can recruit against that, and if you know, just because you're older doesn't always mean you're better. And because some guys may not be working as hard as they need to work on right now for that opportunity, so I, I rationalize it in that way that um, we'll do what we can do and try, have to. And and as a result, to your question, we'll have to do it at a higher level, no doubt. If there if there are teams on our schedule. And there'll they'll be te there'll be teams in our league that will have some of their guys return, or you know, or guys who come uh, to do a graduate year at at, at some of, you know, not a graduate year, but get a second major at some of these places. Uh, there there are teams in our league that will allow that, and so I can't do anything about it. And so I like the challenge of having to do what we're already doing better to confront that. Yeah. It's good, good perspective on it uh, with the 10 guys on the field. Yeah. And, and I also feel not to keep the discussion going, but I also feel like some people, you know, they see this, like the pot, you know, everybody's kind of recognizing like one or two like special transfer cases. I mean, and then every other college kid thinks that maybe he can go and, and have a better experience, but I don't know. I, I agree with your rationale, that it's like, Hey, maybe I can recruit against it. You know, I, I don't have to deal with that at school. So. Yeah. yeah I, I just don't know. You know, let's let's say that there's a hundred people in the in the portal right now, and I and I and I I told um, all of my seniors that if they were interested that they they should do should look into it and see what the market, you know, because it's a weird market right now. The marketplace for that, because of all these schools being unsure of what of their existing seniors are coming back, the top programs are all fighting for those two or three. Uh, of the, the most talented guys that are in there that, that are coming from these other programs. Some of those programs are still fighting to find the money to, to have some of their seniors come back. And, you know, maybe you don't want some of them to come back. And so you can use some of that money to, to go after the really attractive guy in there. But, but most of guys in the portal are pretty good to really good players who just want to play another year. Yeah. And, I assume since they're in there that they have the endorsement of their uh, parents and things like that and affordability and, you know, these schools aren't, aren't cheap. And so, but uh, you haven't heard a lot of where these guys are landing because I think all the culture, affordability, admittability, all that stuff is still being worked out. So who knows what it's going to look like. And with the pressure that all schools are under right now financially, um, I think I think there's going to be a price to pay three or four years from now and maybe sooner where, you know, all these people who clamored for their fifth year, it causes the demise of not their program, but maybe the amount of scholarships that they get and the amount of financial yeah. aid. So be careful what you wish for because the piper is going to need to be paid. Yeah, yeah. All right, enough of that. Let's uh, just uh, – I'd love to hear, like, your history on kind of, like, beginning to be a, a, a lacrosse coach. I know you've uh, – I was looking back in your background. It looked like you you actually went to Harvard – I'm sorry, you went to Notre Dame for a little bit of time and then left and, and coached at St. Anselm. And, uh, you know, just wanted to hear a little bit about, like, how, you know, how you got into coaching and everything. 
Well, like, like most things, it was fortunate. Good luck. I, I, I coached at Notre Dame. I got my, my MBA at Notre Dame in the early 90s. So I had worked in, in New York in finance in the, in the mid to late 80s. And then I, you know, there were a bunch of uh, what, what, what they back then they considered, you know, Black Mondays and Black Tuesdays. And right now, it, that would be considered a good day right now. <laughs> um, but there were some there were some tough days, and I realized I didn't want to be in that world, and so I went back and got my my MBA at at Notre Dame and in communications and, and marketing and management, brand management. So I was able to coach, you know, my uh, Kevin Corrigan and my older brother Steve were roommates at Virginia, teammates, and so uh, Kevin had just became the coach there in, in 1988, 89. And I was his first assistant coach. And so I was able to go to school. Uh, Notre Dame was able to help uh, with that. And so I was able to get my master's degree. And then so I did that and came back to the working world and did that and ended up kind of really focusing on sports marketing for five or six years and had some senior executive positions in a couple of different companies. And I, I got let go of from a public company and I was able to get a, um, a year's severance as a result of being let go. And that was right around the time that my wife and I adopted two boys. So it was kind of a convergence of, of life and not having to worry about for a year about where I was going to work and whether I was going to work. And we adopted these two boys. And so we needed to integrate them into our family. And so it was kind of perfect timing. And we were living in southern New Hampshire at the time in Amherst, New Hampshire, and uh, they needed a, a high school coach. I was playing in the MLL at the time. I was one of the oldest guys in the MLL at that time, and um, we adopted the boys, and I volunteered to coach this high school team. And, and from there, um, I could say that I never worked again. So, the, uh, I, you know, I, did, I ran a lot of camps. I had a small consulting, sports marketing consulting business that I was doing on the time. I was coaching playing and 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 just kind of re you know the, the the great thing about coaching and why i think a lot of people coach is you know the x and o's piece is really important no doubt you have to have a you have to have a certain level of a command there you don't have to be an x's and o's genius and i i know i'm not one but you have to have a certain level of ability there but you know the the connectivity with with parents and kids i think is is a powerful as powerful of a, a drug there is in, in mankind. And so that kind of reawoke in me, you know, missing that connection. Not that you can't have that in business, but it's just not the same. And so I, I coached at this high school, uh, South Egan High School in Southern New Hampshire. And then I coached at St. Anselm College. I was prepared to teach and coach there. And so that, that made it really doable from a financial standpoint. So I was gonna be a marketing professor there and coach and so that was going along really well and I was doing some consulting on the side so you know financially it was it was a win-win my wife is a OBGYN surgeon and so we had you know we had young family so and I really got back into coaching and then Kevin Anderson who used to be the head assistant at Notre Dame was stepping down and I happened to be working the Notre Dame lacrosse camp that summer and, you know, started a conversation with, with Kevin Corrigan about coming back. And then I convinced my wife, my wife's a Notre Dame graduate as well. And so I, I talked her into coming back to South Bend. And, uh, and so that's how, how it kind of happened. Part of it was, you know, career struggles that I was having and, and losing, a, losing a great job and the opportunity that that afforded, you know, they say one door, closes another door opens and that's kind of what happened um in volunteering to be a coach at the high school level in the town just you know wanted to be a good citizen of the town that we lived in and then that just kind of morphed from there yeah um you know obviously you know over the years Notre Dame has always had like essentially known very well known to be having like the best defense in the country or one of the best defense in the country year in, year out. You know, um, the other day we were, uh, we were on a call with John Sexton and um, I was joking with him because I was saying, you know, 
you know, because he was an exciting player to watch, picking up ground balls, throwing checks between the lines. And I know that you probably had to keep a pretty tight leash on him his freshman year. And I asked him about, like, his leash. And he said, yeah, you know, I got the film session. I get torn apart a little bit. But every now and then, coach would let me go. So I guess I, guess I just was curious on, like, your dynamic on maybe – how you coach each player, like, you know, and, and, and so forth. Well, you know, John, John was, John was unique. Um, you know, ironically, like, you know, my generation, my, my brother, Steve is one of the great takeaway defensemen of, of all time. Probably you could argue probably the first great instrument of, you know, of offensive defensemen, not offensive in the sense of scoring, but offensive in the sense of imposing athleticism and takeaway ability on an opponent. He was one of the first, you know, Mark Greenberg from Hopkins and uh, my brother Steve is probably the next iteration of, of that guy. So I, I grew up, you know, both my brother and I started playing late. My brother started playing when he was a sophomore. I started, started playing the ju- uh, spring of my junior year in high school. So ne- even though we were from a town that was crazy passionate about the sport that we had played other sports. And so, but watching my brother develop just as, as a setup to answering your question is that, you know, I, that's what I come from. I was, I wanted to be my older brother and he was lefty and I was righty. And I don't think I ever became as good of a, a takeaway defenseman as he was, but that was the goal. The goal was in that, you know, early eighties, mid eighties, don't slide to me. I'm going to own this guy. That's why you, when you watch those highlights, there's never any slides. The team defense is horrific until until Coach Tierney basically installed a, a slide and recover defense at Princeton. You just didn't help guys because guys would get pissed. Like if you got slid to, and like yeah. if I was guarding you and you came and helped me, I'd be like, yo, yo, blank, blank, blank. What the hell are you doing? That guy can't do anything to me. So, um, but, you know, Coach Tierney kind of revolutionized you know, the concept of team defense, also a fellow Levittown guy, same hometown, is, um, is, you know, so that when I came back to coaching, if you had a guy who had a sense of how to do it, it's not like you gave him license, but what I tried to, I would try to teach him and coach him within our broader and bigger system. And, you know, I, I remember uh, we had a guy, Andrew Irving, who was an All-American long stick mini for us, great player, uh, and John came in after him. And I remember after one of the practices, John's freshman year, I, I tell him, I go, you need to call Irv and, and explain, you know, he'll explain to you how you get on the field. Because if you keep on doing this, you're not going to get on the field. And John was crazy talented. And I know he reached out to Irv because, because what I would tell John and Irv and, and some of the really good takeaway guys we had is that if you play like the way we play, you'll have more opportunities to take the ball away from guys. You'll have more yeah. ground balls. You'll be able to run the field and do the shooting and scoring that you like to do. But you need to do this. Before you get to do what you want to do, I need you to do what you need to do. And yeah. that's what you have to do. So John, you know, ended up winning the Schmeiser and being a, I don't know, three-time first-team All-American. You know, John was crazy gifted. At a, at, you know, John's a good athlete, not a freaky athlete. But John has great spatial awareness and anticipation. And once John kind of played within the way that we wanted to play off-ball defense, and I packaged it in the way which was you'll have more ground balls, more takeaways, that's when it all came together for him. But John is, you know, John was an unbelievably coachable, crazy competitive. He's, you know, was roommates with my son Pierre and, you know, a great, you know, friend of our family. I, and John's one of my all-time favorite guys. Yeah, I, th- I remember uh, the two or three years ago, I was up in Placid, and uh, you and I were playing together. And I remember, uh, I, I remember vividly, maybe like the first possession of the other team, you came out and just smashed a guy in the arm. I'm like, I don't know if he coaches that way. You know what I mean? <laughs> what did you do when you can't move anymore? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not, you know, I, you know, I think coaching, you know, I, I'm a, probably the, one of the basic tenets of what I believe about team defense is, is communicating and convincing and, and helping understand your guys about how they're all connected. They're interconnected. They're interdependent. They have to understand that emotionally, intellectually, spatially. Because if you never understand that, you'll always do what you like to do and what you want to do. Yeah. And so 
that's the, you know, the, the, what we, what's, what's woven throughout my time in South Bend has been communicating that and then doing the drills and the language and the repetitions that reinforce that to help guys understand the cost and the benefit of doing it right versus doing it wrong and, and, and packaging that around what it means to your teammate, what it means to the possession, what it means to your team, what it means to success and failure. So I think if you did a Zoom with, with a bunch of the guys that I coached at, at Notre Dame, I think, you know, the message would be there was a definitely an intensity. It was never personal. It was all about the stop. And as a goalie, I know you appreciate it. It was all about making it hard for your opponent to get great shots. It doesn't mean – the goal shouldn't be taking away great shots. You just want to make it a miserable slog to get that great shot. Slide and recover. Slide and recover. Ball pressure. Communication. Approaches. Like, and, and, and the power and the collective and the aggregate of consistently getting stops is a – it just – lays on top of your opponent. And, and now it becomes this battle between your discipline and determination of how you play and their willingness for patience. And that's why if you look back, some of the great games that we had were against Maryland and Denver and Duke because all of those teams had the patience, they had the skill, and why those games were so powerful to watch. And I, I love them. I mean, I loved – I'd say to Matt Brown before every game, like, here we go again. I love – playing and coaching against you. You know, it sucks to lose some of those, no doubt, but we won our share, they won their share, and you got to love the battle of those. And, you know, I've, I've told that to him dozens of times. And, uh, you know, so – but that, that was what I was trying to create. And it, 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 it appeared to take away some of the individuality, but some guys were perfect for that system. Other guys, you know, John and – John was not a perfect fit – but he was so talented and so athletic that, and he, you know, I, I compromised a little and he compromised and we met in the middle and it allowed him to become a great player. Um, one thing I, I know, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, you invited us down to uh, come out to a practice. And uh, one of the cool things that I guess was like a, like an eye opening thing that I noticed was, you know, like your attention to detail and the skill. So for example, like if you watch like game film, uh, and you watch one of your defensemen goose the ball out and then, you know, get the ball and throw like an underhand pass to one of their teammates. And legitimately at practice, you, you had all the defensemen take a ball and just goose the ball like down the entire field. And I remember going to you and be like, you guys practice this? And, and your response is like, well, if I'm expecting a guy to do it in a game, he better be able to like, we were practicing. We're practicing every skill that's necessary. And I feel like a lot of coaches – you know, that maybe you're going to listen to this, like they sometimes take those small little things for granted, especially like top players in the country, you know, you're coaching and just making sure they're doing things the right way, which I thought was really cool. You know, it's like, it's, you know, if you think back to your, you know, your favorite grammar school or high school teacher, there was something, you know, great about that. Like they, they made the subject come to life. They made it understandable, you know, and, and, Usually how they did it was, was to break it apart to its smallest element. So whether it was learning algebra or the quadratic equation or whatever it was that they came up with some mnemonic, you know, memorization tool or just did it in a way where you were like, your head was nodding and you, and you totally got it. And, and I think all of us that, that coach and teach try to bring elements of that you know, to, to what they do. And, and I, you know, I believe that, you know, that practice is, is your opportunity to kind of rehearse the things that you want to become good at. And I also am a pretty critical eye in film, as, as John Sexton alluded to, is that while you're doing that, you, you start realizing, like, you know what, he's not the only guy not doing that well. Or we keep on giving up a goal, a game, because of that we need to make up a drill that addresses it. So that was, that's the simple kind of mentality is something you're not doing well and how do you make a drill that, that teaches it? So whether it's teaching double teams or teaching um, some of this other stuff is um, you got to do that in a, in a really, you know, you got to do that in a way that, that, 
that's sticky for your guys. Hey, I'm, I'm realizing I'm running out of power here. Do you want to pause and come back? Is that doable? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go find my power cord. Um, all right. Well, um, you know, I wanted to uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, I know that Jake alluded to it earlier. Um, one of the things that just kind of like, I felt like over the years, obviously you being the long time and recognized assistant coach, um, you know, at Notre Dame for so many years, then just, I felt like job postings would happen every year. Your name would be brought up every single time, you know, just kind of curious on your perspective on like, you know, you know, deciding to turn down jobs and then finally ultimately taking this Harvard position, you know, I guess walk us through some of that, um, you know, that, that, you know, kind of the ups and downs of making the decision, you know, obviously I believe like family had a lot to do with it and timing of things and kind of, you know, would love to hear the story about some of that. You know, I think just to preface that, I think, you know, they're, they're in the middle of a you know, major search right now at, at Hopkins is that, you know, most college coaches are, you know, part of uh, a family and, and their significant other works. And, you know, there, there's, it's not as simple as big time basketball and big time football where, you know, the, the concept of moving is, you know, relative to relevant to millions of dollars, you know, and guarantees and all of those things. And so all, you, you always, you know, with lacrosse, you know, and, and if you're older in particular, you're, you're factoring in, you know, how happy are your kids? Where are they going to school? Where are they in that whole, you know, age group? Are they about to, you know, they, you know, juniors in high school and that's really disruptive or are they about to go into high school and maybe, you know, you can, you can deal with that transition. How successful is your significant other? My, you know, my wife is, you know, one of, is maybe one of the best doctors in South Bend. She's great at what she does. She's unbelievably accomplished. So, you know, where are your kids, you know, in their own pursuits and friendships and things like that. So it's, it's financial, it's family, it's timing. It's, there's so much that goes into it. So when, you know, when you, and not that I do, but, um, you know, I know people who do is that they're reading all these chat room chat boards and comments and they're like, how is that guy not taking that job? And it's not as simple as it appears. And then the converse is I was in a great place. I wanted, you know, at one of the great universities of the world when I was at Notre Dame and had a great position, had, you know, great autonomy and support from, from coach Corrigan and from the university. You know, I felt like I had one of the five best jobs in the country when I was here. And so you know, it's not, not as easy as cut and dry saying, why would you want to stay there? As far as, you know, opportunities that came up over the last 10 to 15 years, you know, I, 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 pers you know, I, I was contacted and, and in some cases pursued opportunities and, you know, was afforded the opportunities to decide on all of them. And in some cases, it, you know, went to a, you know, I'm going to decide the next morning, you know, you put your head in your pillow and you're not sure because one of the things that you don't know as you move and, and, and take opportunities is, and the thing you'll never know is like, what is this going to mean to your family? And that, that was always the obstacle for me. The, the, the lack of knowing what this would mean for my three kids, my relationship with them, I knew my wife would never be able to move right when I would move. And so that, all of those things, the unknown of that emotionally, because you couldn't resolve it in your head intellectually. That was the, like, that was always the thing for me and why I could never decide whether to take an opportunity or not. That, that crippled me. And I, and I would, I would get to the, I'm, I'm being totally genuine and totally honest. It was, it was crippling. So, cause you had this professional aspiration where, you know, I need to find out whether I can do this at a really, really high level. And, you know, the confidence that you may have in yourself and your ability to recruit and coach and build a culture and all those things, like that aspiration and that desire is, is unfettered. It's like, it's, it consumes you. And then, so you have the known of that and the known that somebody would like you to come and become there head coach. And then you have the flip of that, which is this unknown of is, you know, will my family be okay? Is this will, you know, will this hurt my 
marriage? Will this hurt my relationship with my kids? And, you know, during the, that whole time, my kids were, you know, just about to start at Culver or just about to start at Notre Dame and I'm coaching my son. You know, those are all like thrown into the mix, yeah. you know, and, and there were opportunities when, when my kids were still at Notre Dame that um, they were really supportive of, you know, I mean, and that really helped, but I could never resolve it in my own head and heart. And that's what ultimately made me say no a bunch of times. And um, as far as what happened this time, you know, I, I think the combination of my kids being out of college and being, you know, being open to, as I told my wife, a sense of adventure, the fact that, that Harvard was really enticing because there was a similarity to the type of student and athlete that, that I would be recruiting. The fact that it was a, you know, the preeminent, you know, academic university in the world was attractive. The fact that they, you know, had struggled finding consistent success was really attractive. And being in a, you know, place like Cambridge and Boston, you know, it was really attractive. And it was really hard, you know, recruiting all the guys to Notre Dame and those relationships. And, you know, the fact that I got tremendous support from them and advocacy from them was, was, you know, made me feel better about it. And then ultimately, you know, my wife being, you know, because she's tremendously successful in what she does, you know, her support and her openness to it, all that stuff made it the right time. I know that was a long answer, but it's a complex. Yeah. It's a complex thing because it's human and it's financial and it's timing and it's unknowns and, you know, all of that came together. It still had an element of that for sure ultimately pulling the trigger. And, and and one of the things that I would always do, not on purpose, but it would get to that, that I'd be so conflicted about deciding that I would almost make them get, you know, hey, we need an answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I know, um, I mean, y y the way you answered it makes a lot of sense. Um, and so as outsiders, sometimes people are like, what? I can't believe he's not taking this opportunity. But again, there's always more to the story. And, and uh Obviously, I appreciate you answering that. And I, I guess one of the things that you just mentioned, um, not to say that, uh, you know, Harvard has had, you know, bad seasons. They weren't, they haven't been the top team in the Ivies, but it sounded like you said that that, that attracted you, that kind of challenge of kind of going in um, and so forth. And so I guess kind of talk me through um, when you decided to take the position, you know, getting to know the guys, like what was your kind of first order of business um, once you actually came on board? You know, I, I felt like, and I actually just discovered this piece of paper the other day because I, I wrote it down and, and it was almost like, this is what we have to do. We have to illuminate Harvard to the whole lacrosse world. And by illuminating, I mean pulling back the curtain, explaining, redefining, opening up what would can appear to be an intimidating and mysterious place because you know it, it it's so it's so prevalent in our culture aspirationally you know in finance and in art and in architecture and in law it's it's everywhere but it's also unknown because maybe a lot of people don't know people who went to harvard and so harvard has been defined by whatever our culture and media has said it is. So the first order of business, besides obviously connecting with your players that you're inheriting and uh, starting the, the recruitment of the 2020 class, I think from a communication standpoint and a research standpoint is that we need to define Harvard the way Harvard should be defined relative to the lacrosse audience. And so that was the first order of business. The first order of business was digging deep and understanding it. And it was understanding admissions. It was understanding the student athlete experience. It was, you know, what the, what the career paths and what the academic paths were, because we needed to be able to articulate it in a way that not only that we could understand, but the universe of lacrosse, high school coaches, travel coaches, prospects, parents, so we went about that in a really focused, 
way. We, I remember we had our first staff meeting in Western Massachusetts, Al Littell, who used to be our director of operations um, at his parents' house in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. And I brought these uh, massive post-it notes and, and I just, I, I'm, I'm kind of that guy. And, uh, and, and I, I made these list of all these words with, that started with the letter C, it just started coming out that way. And I, we would write things on these things and that became kind of our, we need to focus on you know, communication and competitiveness and uh, community and all these, you know, these words, cash, you know, we need to run, run events and things like that. And so we put all these things up and, and I, I discovered that list of, of, of things from that first meeting. It was amazing how many things we, we checked off and, and, and achieved in, in eight months. And so, but the first thing was understanding Harvard, articulating Harvard, making Harvard understandable to all these audiences, making it achievable, make it aspirational. And if we can do that, we'll broaden the universe of people who see themselves, who maybe didn't see themselves as Harvard candidates. And I, I can think of a couple of recruits who didn't see themselves that way. And until we used video and virtual tours and photos and alumni, until we did that, we were able to, to convert a lot of uh, prospects who didn't see themselves necessarily as Harvard people, because in their minds, Harvard people was defined by Hollywood and the media, and our redefining of it made it feel like there's people like me here. And that became a mantra for me. We need to make it clear that there's people like you at Harvard. And, and, and you know, Harvard is an unbelievably diverse place. More than 50% of this year's freshman class was non-white. And, and as a result, it's the first school in the history of American education besides a hysterically black college or university that could say that. And so as a result, and Harvard gives a tremendous amount of financial aid, is that it wasn't just this monolithic place where everybody had numerals after their names and was a Rockefeller or a Carnegie or a Morgan. No, there's everybody's here. So once we were able to do that, the universe of people who became possible prospects for Harvard became massive. And yep. I, and we're still doing that to this day. Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I know we touched on it, like, uh, even before the interview started, just, uh, like, your willingness to go the extra mile, essentially not on the field. So, like, a lot of people will kind of look at, like, all right, the coach, you know, he's going to be working with the kids and the players, locker room, out on the field. And then your willingness to connect. And I know part of the reason was to, like you said, to make – uh, Harvard and yourself accessible to everybody. And, and as soon as you took that position, like immediately I started seeing like YouTube videos, of like the tours and like, you know, the instructional stuff that you're doing right now. I mean, honestly, like, uh, like I'm, I'm a person, I know I speak for a lot of people, like I thank you for doing that because you provide a lot of educational stuff that actually a lot of coaches forward along to their, their teams, other coaches and, and stuff like that. It's actually you know, without even maybe realizing you're actually helping grow the game through like a lot of those videos and stuff, which is awesome. You know, it's, it's the right thing to do as a lacrosse community citizen, you know, sharing. We, we all kind of copy and, and customize whether we take something from another sport or we take it from another coach. You go to the coaches' conventions and you're always looking for drills and terminologies. So, yeah, yeah. Are there novel ideas? Of course. Do, do, you, do you keep some of those closer? Definitely, but there are, there are things, consistent things that we're all doing that you can share. And you know, even before we did this call, uh, I, I, I shot another uh, drill, another webinar that we're gonna put out there. But you know, I, I like the idea of, of, of engaging in that way. I felt like it was a great tool for us to humanize Harvard and make Harvard feel accessible and less intimidating and much more approachable that you know, whether it was sharing the beauty of campus or the impressive alumni or the amount of academic service or what's unique about the residential life at Harvard, all those things needed to be articulated. And as we were starting, we were fortunate that there was a, you know, a good library of those things already existing. So we went about on increasing our, our presence on social because again, getting back, we wanted to dis define what Harvard was. I didn't want to rely on somebody else's narrow view of it because when, when you have a narrow view of something, it's really easy to be negative or really easy to pigeonhole it in a really simple 
you know, way, you know, every place in Harvard is no different, is, is much more complex than it appears on the surface. And so to, to minimize that complexity, let's use things that are already existing, but let's also produce our own thing. But not, and I think one of the first things that we also did that we put out there was, let's put some highlights of past performance because we don't want it to just be about the totality of the experience at Harvard, which, which is an important part of our message, but let's not forget that they've had really good wins, they've had really good players, they've recruited really good players, that we have really good facilities. We don't want to ever get too far away from the lacrosse message because that's going to be probably be, besides the aspiration to go to Harvard, they have to believe that we're going to be a championship caliber team at some point. And so we never got away from that. So one of the first things we did was part was the defining of Harvard. And I, I would hazard to guess one of the first things that we ever put out was around here's us playing lacrosse and we can make really good plays. That's awesome. Um, I, just a couple more questions. Um, one thing I'm always a big fan of asking is like, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's a, a current coach, past coach, lacrosse, non-lacrosse, who, who, who are some people that um, maybe, I guess, like inspire you that maybe like other sports or other coaches that you're kind of like, you know, maybe you talk to or listen to or read about um, that kind of like help you kind of develop a little bit more um, to your coaching strategy and culture and stuff? Um, you know, I, I, I loved watching Mike Bray coach. He's the basketball coach at Notre Dame. He was, he's unbelievably kind and, and forthcoming. You know, I would go to their practices and sit right on the bench and watch them play and coach. I was friendly with all their assistant coaches. And so I liked his, his style, which was, was had an intensity to it, but it was, it was, you know, it was about the players. It was about them learning how to play. You know, I like to say, you know, all the stuff that I know doesn't really matter. What really matters is your ability of your players to digest it and apply it and execute it. So all, you know, all the X's and O's knowledge is not for to impress your players. It's you're figuring out which of that do you distill down and give to them because it's important. And then more importantly, their ability to execute it in the cauldron of competition in the fourth quarter when the game is tied. So, you know, uh, Mike was a big influence. Um, you know, my, my older brother, Steve, from a, from a hunger, effort, dedication, commitment to becoming a good player and a good teammate, a great player and a great teammate, I should say. And, you know, that col colors a lot of my messaging to my, my players around, you know, dedication and commitment and selflessness and, um, you know, supporting as you hunger for your own development to bring other people along. He was, you know, a mentor for me in my own development as a player. Um, you know, I think, you know, my high school coach, uh, you know, Jack Moran, also from Levittown, so it's a whole Levittown thing here, man, is, uh, you know, he took a chance on me. I didn't deserve to make that team as a junior in high school. He had coached my older brother, Steve, who at that point, when I was a junior in high school, my older brother was a uh, sophomore at UVA and one of the best defensemen in the country. I think he, you know, because it was a genetic connection, I think he totally kept me on that team only because he had coached my older brother and my older brother had already become a great player. And uh, I didn't play a second my junior year. I played attack and, um, well, some people would say I didn't play attack because I didn't play at all. But, um, but you know, that was that started it to, to play on the varsity my junior year at Chaminade and to, you know, not play and then look at my brother's hunger and take some of the lessons of what he had done. So, you know, those are probably – and my college coach, two college coaches, Dick Garber, who's, you know, one of the winningest coaches in Division I, um, Again, I didn't, I didn't even try out. I didn't bring my equipment to college. My dad had to drive it up. My dad was a fireman. He drove it up after one of his shifts and brought my equipment because I went to watch practice, one of the tryouts and, and thought I could hang with those guys. And, and so, you know, Dick Garber and my defensive coach, Eric Kemp, who was, you know, I think I take some of Mike Bray, who's, you know, kind and calm and empowering of his players, and Eric Kemp, who was – 
uh, played at Middlebury and was my defensive coach uh, when I was in college. He was tough and demanding and focused on really little things, little micro elements. I think that the combination of all those guys kind of helps. And, and obviously Coach Corrigan, coaching with him for so long, you know, his command of X's and O's and preparation. So if you look at all of those guys kind of coming together, it helps create the stew of, of kind of who you are as a coach. Yeah, absolutely. I know that, um, I know that, uh, yeah. you know, typically we yeah. have these, uh, these, uh, we finish up these like interviews by asking the coach, like, all right, you know, what, what should these young players be like focusing on to get recruited and stuff like that? Um, you know, I actually, um, think you're one of the best coaches, you know, it, like it, it, lacrosse coaches in the world. Okay. All right. I, I've, you've been somebody like a secret, like kind of mentor to me because I know, like I said, you, like you post a lot of stuff. A lot of us watch that stuff. I'm honored to get the chance to kind of talk to you. I would almost like say, instead of that, tell them what, what us, what like young kids should do, like talk to us about maybe like what some coaches should do that are starting to get into the game and how to create, like, I guess, a positive culture and try to, like, um, I don't know, maybe give some advice for guys that want to continue to grow within the game. You know, I, th I think you always have to, you have to start with a, with a great understanding of yourself. I think, you know, taking an inventory, if you're, you know, step back. You know, one of the things about doing these webinars and doing coaches clinics is that, you know, you see the real, which, which, you, which you can totally forecast, the growth of the game 10 years ago. When you look at the development of coaches clinics, you look at your guys club system that you've put together, you can totally see it coming because it was starting to be on TV a lot. You know, guys were starting to be able to earn a living doing it. And, you know, the attendance at these coaching clinics, you know, that, that schools were running were, were totally blowing up. You know, the engagement on social was, was taking off. So you could totally see it coming. And so, you know, that's almost a bit overwhelming when you're thinking about, you know, advice to give to, um, you know, a coach uh, coming into the game. I'll answer a different part about players, but for a coach, it's almost overwhelming the amount of content that he has. Uh, so he almost has to curate it in a way that becomes digestible for him. But I think you have to start with yourself, like knowing your own personality, knowing your own aspirations, why you're doing it, you know, is it is it about – connectivity is it about you know it should be about financials because nobody's really doing that well doing it but um you know why are you doing it and what does it fuel and feed in you i know why i do it i, I love the connection with players and, and and helping them get better and get better as people and, and uh teammates um but knowing your why i think becomes really important i know that's a cliche but i think that's really important because knowing why you do it it is, will fuel your, your hunger for excellence. Um, starting with, you know, a lot, with a lot of guys who get into it, they're coming from a high school program or a college program that was really formative, just like it was for me. And what are you going to bring from them that you believe can be successful? That becomes really important. What did you learn from your high school coach? What did you learn from your college coach? And what of that are you going to distill out and drag out? And that will be probably become the, the foundation uh, form of your – of your coaching. And then with all the stuff that's out there on various YouTube channels and Instagram live and, and Twitter and things like that, you know, what do you like? Cause you can't like everything. Cause then you won't have a, an ethos of your own coaching, like what, what you believe and, and how you can build on that belief system with some other people are doing. I think that's really probably really hard now because there's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of people doing some good stuff. There's like some guys putting stuff out there. You're like, I need to unteach that guy when he sh when that when he shows up, you know. And so, you know, so but you got to discern. It's it's like Netflix. Like you're scrolling through Netflix and you're trying to figure out what what's your next show. And sometimes you got a recommendation from a guy and you're like, nah, I don't know if I like that guy's taste. Or do you watch the thing that everybody loves? Now you're a follower, but guess what? It still is great. Just in case every just because everyone watch it doesn't mean it's not great or not compelling. So it's probably hard to be a guy up and coming. But, you know, we're doing these webinars, these one clip, one drill webinars on, on, uh, with Harvard now. And they've been, you know, really well received. The engagement when we do the chat element is really high. And you can definitely see guys, the questions that they get, whether, you know, what my philosophy is on an approach or what my philosophy is on slide or where should my body be turned? There's, you know, you never want to be like, 
this is the only way to do it because you know that's not true. You're trying to find a way that works with your mentality. So I always, you know, I, I, I don't want to be dogmatic about stuff. There's certain stuff that I am dogmatic about, but even within that, you're like, you're letting guys know that there's different ways to slide and there's different ways to double team. And this is just one way. And if it works for you and you feel comfortable teaching it and you see success, then I guess it works for you. Awesome. Um, any words of encouragement for the young players out there? You know, listen, I, I, I don't think, you know, if you're a senior in high school right now, I, you know, you're potentially getting double whammy. You're going to, might show up on a team that has transfers and returnees and, you know, you're missing your prom, you're missing your season. And, you know, it's, it's painful. You know, I think that's, it's probably more painful than for a college guy. A college guy is 22. He's mature. He's more fully formed. And listen, I'm, I feel for my guys. I wish they were all coming back. You know, I want, you know, that was our whole thing. Our whole mantra at Harvard was let's find out how good we can be. And, you know, you'll win some of them, you'll lose some that you were really good at, right? So not being able to find that out is, is crushing. And I, you know, and, and I miss our guys, you know, I think, but I, I think it might be more painful for a high school guy. You know, he's 17, 18 years old and you're not as fully formed yet. And so you're going to struggle with, with that. So, you know, my advice for, you know, the seniors that are going on to play is, you need to continue to be a great leader on the team that you're still on, even though your team is not competing, you're probably still doing workouts and zoom meetings and, and doing some culture building and leadership stuff is to be really, really engaged in that because there's huge value and they'll remember that much longer than the great goal you scored when earlier in the season, they'll remember how you treated them, how you spoke to them, how you mentored them and, and how you're preparing for your opportunity next fall. Are you still wallowing? Or are you leading by owning today and managing today and, and doing that into the, into the future? I think there's real value in that. As for, you know, and as, those guys also have to prepare for their, for their college season. So you know, my, my advice for guys is, is you can't wallow in it much longer. You know, we're all sad, but you have to kind of manage today. And, and there's nobody looking over your shoulder. You can actually lie on Zoom that you did your workouts. Nobody's going to know, and and but you'll know, and it'll be found out eventually. You know, when you get to a summer tournament or some tournament where you're all together. So, you know, I think um, the fact that you know, that young guys have to learn how to have conversations again with their parents and their siblings, and they're back in the home. Too, I think that's a great thing. The fact that they have to be, you know, the the manager of their own day in academics, like you have to do great in school. If you're a junior right now, you better be crushing school because everybody's in the same boat and any school, whether it's Harvard or some other place, the excuse of, Oh, this was really hard. Or, you know, I, my teacher's not great on zoom. Nobody cares. Nobody's going to have any, no, any empathy for you because we're all in the same boat. And if you're not crushing school, even within bad internet connection, teacher who's not, wasn't great when you were in his classroom live and now he's got to do it over a computer, nobody cares. So you better be crushing school and actually doing it better than everybody else because that's what an athlete does. An athlete is used to dealing with these obstacles. If you're a true competitor and a true athlete, a true teammate and a true guy who wants to do great things, this is just enough. This is like a rainy day in the spring or it's snowing and you have to play, go to practice. Wishing the snows to stop is not going to stop. Or you just, you know what? I'm going to stretch in the mud and I'm going to do this drill in the mud. And then my hands are cold. An athlete, you know, whether it's a guy who's committed to Harvard or one of our incoming guys, I told them on the Zoom, nobody cares, fellas. Harvard's not going to care. So crush it, crush school crush your preparation. No one's going to care that you didn't have a weight room. So I don't know, curl that metal chair in your backyard. That's part of your patio furniture. I don't care. That's, that's my message to them. The time for being sad is probably past. Get on to the doing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate it, coach. I appreciate you spending the time with, uh, 
with us today. Um, and, uh, obvi- you know, you know, like, like, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of us are excited to see, um, you know, you know, how things go at, at Harvard. And, and we've got a lot of like fans of Harvard now, you know, moving, maybe moving from Notre Dame with you to, to Harvard. So, uh, so we'll we're, take them. yeah, we're, I'm, 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 you know, and, and like I said, I really appreciate you taking the time. You've been, you've been somebody that I've looked up to, you know, coaching and I, you know, was, I, I didn't say it to you, but it was one of the coolest things when I got a chance to play with you a couple of years ago in Placid. And, and, and like I said, I appreciate you taking the time. Wow. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for the platform and, and the advocacy, and I think these are great. These are great things because it, you know, the the questions, you know, uh, uh, answering these questions are helpful for us because it gets back to our why and how we got here. And it's hard not to look at the past. I I, I want to make that's it's hard not to look at the past. But you know, the situation you're in, if you don't understand why you're doing things, this this the pandemic will force you to figure out why you work out or how you work out or how you eat or how you sleep, you know, the key relationships with your families and friends, it super values all that stuff. So I'm trying to, I would never be considered an optimist by the people who know me, but I definitely become much more optimistic about, you know, reconnecting with family and friends, you know, making good decisions each day, connecting with the people that matter. And, you know, I think if that could be a potential silver lining, in all of this, you know, not at the price of people getting sick and sick and obviously, you know, so much collateral damage on this, but I think we have to look for the benefits in all of this. So you doing things like this, it helps me uh, look uh, at myself uh, hard again, as I look at myself on the screen and it, it'll, it'll help me become a better coach and a better husband and a better father. And so I appreciate the opportunity to do it. Awesome. Thanks again, coach. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> Out. Peace out.